Om Sam Saraswati Namaha Namaste. Namaste everyone. Happy Passover and happy Boishaki and happy Hanuman Jayanti and happy days are here again. Uh, in uh, chapter one we confronted too much and too little. And in chapter two, we met the generals in the army being devoid of clear understanding, fickleness, haughtiness, the great deceiver, want of resolution, memories, wandering to and fro, and hypocrisy. And now in chapter three, we're going to meet some more of the generals in the army of the great ego, and we're going to do battle with the ego himself. The general's names are disbelief. I don't believe a word that you're saying. What kind of nonsense, tall tales you're telling me. Arrogance, anxiety, blindness, violent temper. <laughs> passion, the great deceiver, irresistible temptation, and foul mouth. And those are some of the generals in the army of the Mahan Isha Ashura, the great ruler of duality that we're going to meet in chapter 3. And now, ladies and gentlemen, on page 163, of the Chandipat, we're going to begin with the meditation on the form of the mother of the universe who presides over this, this victory. The radiant body of the mother of the universe has the magnificence of a thousand rising suns. Do you remember chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita? Krishna is said to, when Arjun looked at Krishna, he saw the radiance of a thousand rising suns. I mean, she's pretty bright. She is draped in a sari of red silk and yellow and Around her neck is a garland of red skulls. Her two breasts have been colored with, are, have been colored with red sandal paste. The red skulls upon her, uh, the, make, the garland of the, of, around her neck, mostly are my head. Because uh, she cuts it down every hour on the hour, whether she needs it or not. In her four hand, lotus-like hand, she holds a rosary and shows the mudras of knowledge, fearlessness, and granting boons. Uh, this is Gyan Mudra, Avoidan, and Bordan. Her three eyes are shining and her butt-like mouth is extremely beautiful. <laughs> Just look at her pucker up. <laughs> Upon her head sits a crown of jewels in which the moon is situated and she is resting upon a lotus seat with unlimited devotion. I bow down to this goddess who wears my head around her neck, a garland of skulls, and Om, the Rishi said, when the great thoughts thus saw their forces being destroyed, that heroic general devoid of clear understanding in great anger proceeded to battle with the mother of the universe. And he kept saying, I am devoid of clear understanding. I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. What do you mean I have to become the mother of the universe? How am I going to become the mother of the universe? I am devoid of clear understanding. I am really ruled over by the great ego, and I'm just a general in the army of the great ego. I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. And that thought rained upon the goddess a cloud of the arrows of various doubts, as plentiful as the waters that fall from a cloud upon Mount Meru. So he, he, every time he shot an arrow, I started doubting again. What are you telling me? This can't be true. How can you tell me to become the Divine Mother? The only way to give up the ego is to take away the energy from the ego, give it to the Mother, and become the Mother, and worship the Mother, and love her so much that there's no separation, there's no distinction, there's no difference between us, and then I, I can defeat the, she can defeat the ego. 
What nonsense! This is fairy tales! This is pie in the sky! Uh, I don't believe a word that you say. I doubt you completely. Then the goddess fired such a multitude of arrows that cut his arrows into pieces and also killed his horses and his charioteer. So she fought back. With this, she also cut his bow and his exceedingly high banner. Ah, look at the pride of this uh, devoid of clear understanding. He goes into battle carrying a banner. Uh, look at me, I'll make everyone doubt. Don't you follow your guru. <laughs> Don't listen to her. I mean, who is the guru anyway? What does she know? If she knew so much, why would she be here telling me what I should do? <laughs> She'd be up in heaven running the world. After cutting his bow, she pierced his bodies with her arrows. Losing his bow, his chariot, his horses and charioteer, that thought took up his sword and shield and ran after the goddess. Get her! With the sharp edge of his sword, he struck the lion on the, the head. He'd try and beat the Dharma over the head. And with great speed, he gave a blow to the goddess on her left arm. Some people said it was her left hand, and that's why her hand got a little bit funky. Uh, she got the carpal tunnel and Dufutren's disease because the, the devoid of clear understanding struck her on the left hand. With that sword, when that sword touched her body, it broke into pieces. Uh, she got a scratch and he broke the, the, the sword just shattered into pieces. And that angry thought of many considerations took a pike in his hand. Uh, he didn't give up. And that great thought threw that glaring pike at the excellent one beyond time, just as the sun fills the heavens with dazzling luster. That's quite a pike. Uh, when the goddess saw that pike coming at her, she too let loose her pike, which split his weapon into numerous pieces and, devoid of clear understanding, gave up his life. Dum dum. No more doubts. <laughs> I gotta do it. After the death of that valiant general in the army of the great ego, devoid of clear understanding, who had been the source of affliction to many gods, fickleness approached mounted on an elephant. And he said, oh, let's try that sadhana. Oh, let's go see that guru. Oh, let's try this sadhana. Oh, should I worship Kali or should I worship Lakshmi or should I worship Saraswati? Maybe on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'll worship one of each. Maybe I'll learn to do, maybe I'll chant in Hebrew or in Latin or I'll do namas. And after the death, a devoid of clear understanding, fickleness approached on an elephant. He attacked the goddess from above with his energy, but the mother of the universe with the shout of her mantra, Hoom! she wounded him and deprived of light, the energy fell to the earth. When he found that his energy was broken, fickleness became intensely angry. Now he threw his pike at her, but the goddess cut it with her arrows. In all of this, the god lion of the goddess, Mr. Dharma, jumped upon the head of the elephant and began an intensive battle with that thought. So the goddess's lion jumped on, on Fickleness's elephant, and those two began, began to rumble. Those two fought and fought, and the elephant fell to the ground, and then they rose in excessive rage and began to fight again with fierce blows. Thereafter, with great speed, the lion leaped into the atmosphere and falling from the sky, severed the head of fickleness from his body. <laughs> uh, 
no match for Dharma. Fickleness is no match for Dharma. Once we make a commitment with a big C to Dharma, then fickleness gave up his life. Haughtiness was slain by the goddess with stones and trees in that battlefield, and striking with his paws and biting with his teeth, the lion brought down disbelief. Striking angrily with her club, the goddess reduced arrogance to powder. Churna courted the itch. <coughs> uh, memories was cut by the sword. Anxiety and blindness by her arrows. Violent temper and passion and the great deceiver too were slain by the three-eyed seer of all. They're all meeting their demise at the hands of the goddess. Hypocrisy's head was cut by the sword, and irresistible temptation and foul mouth were both sent to the kingdom of death by her arrows. You blankety blankety blank blanks. <laughs> Seeing his army thus being destroyed, the great ego assumed the form of a buffalo, the most stubborn beast uh, in India. You, you remember he's, the buffaloes just stand in the middle of the highway and look at the trucks. They just stand there. Everyone stops for the buffalo. And he himself began to terrify the troops of the goddess. Sometimes he fought with his snout, sometimes kicking with his hooves in the air, sometimes hitting with his tail, sometimes whirling around while ripping with his horns. With great speed and a great war cry, his breath puffing in exertion, he scattered the troops over the ground. The stubborn ego wasn't going to move for anybody. He went and he attacked. Having laid low the troops of her army, that thought advanced to kill the lion of the goddess. Then the mother of the universe became very angry. You're going to attack Dharma? You want to attack Dharma, Mr. Ego? Let's see what happens to you. That great evil one, the great eagle also became very angry. He kicked the earth with his hooves and raised large mountains with his horns and threw them aside as he roared. With the great speed of this thought, the earth split in fear while his tail lashed the sea of desire, causing the waters to flood the earth. In fact, there wasn't anywhere on earth that was free from desire. The flood of desire spilled over and covered all the earth. Tossing about his horns, he dashed and split the clouds to pieces and cast up by the violent speed of his breath winds. <gasps> Mountains fell from the sky. And waging battle in this great anger, the great thought advanced towards her, while she who tears apart thought assumed anger and prepared to slay him. Throwing her net, she bound that great thought. And after being bound in that great encounter, he left his form as a buffalo, and thereafter he manifested in the form of a lion. In this condition, the mother of the universe was prepared to cut off his head, but somehow he changed his form again to that of a man bearing a sword. Then the goddess instantly rained upon him a shower of arrows, and with sword and shield she was ready to pierce him. And just then, he took the form of the king of elements. Look at this devious, tricky, chalaki, this, this great ego. That's what she is doing now. 
Oh yeah! And, and she, he continually changes his form. And sometimes he's a man bearing a sword, and sometimes he's a lion, sometimes he's an elephant, sometimes he roars, sometimes he's a buffalo, but always he is the great ruler of duality. See him in your lives. See him in all of our lives. Sometimes I am Joe Sadhu, and sometimes I am Swami the servant, and sometimes I do Tapasya, and sometimes I'm Swami the administrator of the Devi Mandir. How many forms does the great ego have? He changes his form all the time. With his trunk, he began to pull the huge lion of the, god, of the goddess and to roar. But as he was pulling, she cut the trunk with her sword. Then that great thought again wore the body of a buffalo. And in the manner as before, with the inhalation and exhalation of his breath, he shook the three worlds with all that moves and moves not. When mom gets freaky, man, move out of the way. Everybody quakes. <laughs> She'll cut off your head. I look into the garland of my heads around her neck. In great rage, the mother of the perceivable world, you, she who tears apart thought, again and again drank an excellent spirit and with red eyes began to laugh. I don't know what she was drinking, but I presume it was an excellent spirit. <laughs> and the nectar of devotion. Whatever the substance in the cup was, she was drinking the nectar of devotion. And there in the strength and boldness of that wild ecstasy, that evil demon roared and with his horns through mountains at she who tears apart thought. And she began to pulverize those mountains with her arrows of speech. Every time she said a mantra, every time she said a, a, a word of Sanskrit, she pulverized the mountains, just fell to dust. Speaking in the ecstasy of spirit, her mouth became ragged, and her, her tongue was stuttering. And the goddess said, Garja, Garja, Kshnamura, Madhu, Ya, Bhakti, Bam, Ya, Hum. Hey, roar and roar, you fool. For so long as I drink this spirit, roar as much as you like. I'm going to drink all the bhakti, all the devotion of all the devotees while I'm ex consuming their devotion. You, you can roar as much as you like. Your death is in my hands. And when I have finished drinking, soon the gods will be roaring. <laughs> hey, gods! Prepare yourself to become illuminated. <laughs> and the Rishi said, <clears throat> Thus speaking, the goddess leaped and ascended above that great thought, pressing down upon him and holding him with her foot, she struck him in the throat with a pipe. And the great ego, again, hit by the foot of the goddess, changed his form from his mouth. Just came right out of his mouth. And, but when he was only able to free half of his body. And with her great strength, the goddess restrained that as well. So there was half of a body of a man coming out of the mouth of, of, the, of the ego. Even with the half of his body coming out, the great e that great thought wades battle with the goddess. He doesn't want to give up. I'm going to fight to the very last breath. Umting shwashtak may jut kantarum. I am not going to surrender. I am. Not, I don't know the word samarpan. I don't know the word shanti. I am the great ruler of duality, and I shall not abdicate my duality with my last breath. And then the goddess cut off his head with a great double-edged sword. <laughs> 
Shrieking and crying, the remaining forts of that army ran away, and all the gods became exceedingly joyous. <laughs> Yay! Jai Ma! In great satisfaction, the gods joined the great seers of hymns, a praise to the goddess while the celestial chorus and nymphs sang and danced with joy. The Gandharvas and the Apsaras and the Devas and the Rishis and the Munis and everyone in the Devi Wonder sang and danced with joy. Ah. Oh. Wow, why did he catch that? <laughs> Om Sam Saraswati in the Maha. And in this way, we became strong enough in our devotion that we could cause the goddess to drink the nectar of devotion, and we forgot all about me and mine and all of my problems and all of my troubles. In fact, I prayed to the goddess, Mom, you are the energy of all in everything. Please take away the energy from the great ego and give it to the divinity within me. Let me remember only you. Cut off his head. Off with their heads! <laughs> Namaste. Let's see if there are any questions tonight. We have a question from Sham. Namaste, Sham! <laughs> Namaste, Mon Swamiji. I am feeling like the generals of the great ego with anxiety and violent temper that are uh, out of my control. I'm unable to control them. What can I do? Sham, all we can do is pray. With the greatest intensity of devotion of which you are capable, pray to Hashem that please give me peace. Pray, please give me, take the energy away from all of these, all the Mishigas, all the craziness, all the Chanchal Garbar. Take the energy away and give it to the divinity within. And then let us, let us remember our divine nature. That's an excellent question, Sham. All we can do is pray. And the more intensity and the more sincerity and the greater the prayer, the stronger the prayer, the more we forget about the craziness and the anxiety and all the assurances that keep hitting us and attacking us. And we become one with the Divine Mother Goddess. We're, Mother ch children. We have a question from Laura. Namaste, Laura. Pranam. Chandima seems to be filled with such joy and enthusiasm for the, for the battle. When I contemplate these generals, I only feel anxious because I feel as though they are winning. How can I increase my faith so that I persevere in sadhana and Chandi will defeat these generals in me? Laura. Watch the generals meet their demise at the hands of the mother and think about the mother and don't think about the generals. <laughs> Be pleased that they're dropping like flies because they are. They don't stand a chance in front of the mother. So become one with the mother and give your devotion to mother and be, be, be the devotee of the mother and then you become in the presence of the mother and then you become the mother. And you don't even think about the generals in the army of the Asuras. Who are they compared to being one with the mother? Now, the way to do that is through what we call karma yoga. And karma yoga is siddhant achara. The achara, the behavior, according to the siddhant, according to the scriptures, and there are seven forms of behavior according to the scriptures which bring us into union with God. Puja, Pat, Homa, Sangeet, Nrit, Provachan, and Arpana. Worship, recitation of scriptures, sacred fire ceremonies, singing, dancing, explaining what you're doing and why you're doing and what you hope to get for it, and serving. These seven forms of behavior have the capacity to bring us into a state of yoga. And yoga is nitya karma. Nitya karma means it's eternal. So whenever we perform one of these forms of 
worship. We come into yoga, we have the capacity to come into yoga. At least it's better than no capacity at all. If I go to the pool hall and shoot pool and drink beer and, and, and dance a hoochie coo, put quarters into the jukebox, uh, I don't know if they still have those, but... <laughs> if I have that behavior, that's not going to bring me into union. It, I mean, it has no capacity. It has no capacity to bring me into union. So if I do worldly karma, I'm only in the world. And I'm going to stay there for a long, long time until one day some swami comes and kicks me in the pants and says, do Nitya karma. And Nitya karma has the capacity to become karma yoga. And karma yoga is not reliant or not dependent upon the past or the future or the, uh, it just fills our presence with the eternal. I'm not longing for any fruit from this karma, just being able to forget about me is the reward sufficient for me. If even for a few minutes I can forget about me and mine and all my stuff, whoo, I have been rewarded amply. So Laura, the object is to perform the Nitya Karma, the Karma Yoga, the Siddhanta Chara, the behavior according to the scriptures as much as we can so that we can forget the many forms of me and the importance of me and we become devotees of the mother and then we get to be in the presence of the mother and then we get to worship the mother and then we become the mother and then we forget all about the asuras and that's how it works and there is no other way by which it can be attained. Adati prati grinati. As he gives, so shall he receive. And this is the form of the pin by which all of this has been bound. Yes, please. We have a question from Nanda in San Jose. <laughs> Namaste, Nanda Ma. Namaste. Don't we need the ego to make good decisions? Will not a person with no sense of ego be helpless like a baby and a burden to the world? Please help me understand what it means to live without an ego. My ego has never made a good decision. I promise you, every decision my ego makes is on behalf of me. And therefore, there is selfish attachment. And he never made a good decision for me. Only my conscious being can make a good decision for me. Only her ego can make a good decision for me. If I have the ego, aham brahmashmi. If I have the ego, shivo aham, I can make a good decision. Now, that means that I have to discriminate every decision. Do I have selfish interest in this decision? If yes, it's an ego decision. Now, can I remove my ego from this and have non-selfish, unselfish interest in this decision? If I can be unselfish, then it's a pure decision and I'm serving God by doing the same action. If I go to my job because I'm going to get paid on Friday and I'm going to pay my rent and I'm going to pay my bills, I mean, those are all nice things. But if I go to my job because I get to serve God, and this is a way I can become a tool, an instrument of her peace, a tool in the hands of the master craftsman, a car in the, uh, with her in the driver's seat, if I am serving her by going and making my contribution in this way, then it's a pure decision. But if I want to get paid so I can fulfill my obligations and pick up my burdens and hold a, fulfill my responsibilities and complete my obligations, then I am going to be miserable for a long, long time. So, Nandama, let's discriminate as to what is a pure decision and what is a mixed decision. <laughs> And what's a mixed up 
musician. <laughs> a crazy mixed up decision made by a crazy mixed up ego. Please. We have a question from Sadat Mananda in Washington. Namaste Sadat Mananda. Namaste. What does this verse mean? He kicked the earth with his hooves and raised large mountains with his horns and threw them aside as he roared. That ego was so disruptive in his behavior, he was demonstrating his temper, he was showing his anger, he was mouthing off with his foul mouth, and he was kicking the earth and stomping his feet and picking up mountains and hurling them. I mean, there were no limitations to the demonstration of the anger and egotism, selfishness of his ego. He was willing to destroy others just because he wanted his way. No, Rashid. Yes, they are not. We have a question from Sharanya in Walnut Creek. Namaste, Sharanya. Pranam, is there any spiritual significance to the great ego constantly shifting forms from the buffalo, man, elephant, etc.? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look at your own life. How many Sharanyas are there? Huh? There's, there's a Sharanya who's the devotee of Chandi. And there's the Sharanya who goes to work. And there's the Sharanya who is daughter to her mother and sister to her sister and friend to her friend. There are so many different Sharanyas. Each one of them has a different name. <laughs> Each one of them has a different dress. Each one of them has a different voice. Each one of them has a different diction. Each one has a different vocabulary. Each one of them has a different way of sitting. You don't go home and sit on the floor in a lotus posture and sit there for hours and hours chanting Sanskrit. Different character. Each one is a different character. Look at how you change your form. And sometimes you become a man with a sword. You're very dangerous. And sometimes you're an elephant, big fat, and <laughs> love for all. And sometimes you're a lion with courageous fortitude. Sometimes you're just a little old buffalo, so stubborn you won't get out of the road. Sometimes you keep changing your form, Sharanya, as I do. We have lots of buffaloes. <laughs> we have lots of buffaloes. Yes, we do. We've got a herd of buffaloes. The Davy Munder is filled with buffaloes. The most stubborn devotees that you could imagine. And that's the significance, Sharanya. We just keep changing our form and we come become full of love or we become full of, of ego, we become full of hatred, we become mean, we kick the earth, we stomp our feet, we yell insults and hurl slurs and do all kinds of nefarious activities. Everything to keep us from doing puja. <laughs> Every excuse we can find. So I don't have to, okay, I gotta sit down and actually take on the push bay. Yes, please. Okay, so does the stubbornness represent our uh, desire to not change? In yes. terms of our opinions, who we think we are? Right. I, we have an identity that we, this is me. Uh, I gotta be me. I'm not gonna put myself in the mold of her. I've gotta be me. Why should I change me? It's, it's I'm good the way I am. Uh, I could become a little better. Just give me a, give me a boatload of money and I'll be fine. <laughs> give me more resources, I'll, uh, I'll be fine. I don't need to change me. I'm perfect the way it is. <laughs> That's exactly what it is, that stubbornness that says, I don't need to change. Just give me your give me more resources and I'll show you how good I am. It doesn't say I'll give make let me change myself into someone who's more efficient and I will get more resources and then show you how prolifically I can share them. It says, give me more resources and I'll show you what I can do. But I don't want to change. What's all this sovereign of business anyway? I don't believe this stuff. This is, this is, I disbelief. 
We are devoid of clear understanding. I don't, I don't believe what you're saying to me. I should actually sit down and do some job and top every day. Every day? I'm important. Do you know how much time I have to spend in the morning? I have to go to work. Do important things. I mean, I'm going to sit with God? <laughs> That's not important. Just let God bless me with more. And then I'll show God how strong I can be. Yeah, hey, Jindaki. Uh, yes, please. Um, so is there any significance in the fact that mother uh, killed him when he came back to the buffalo? Or he, he, he kept changing his form and changing his form and as it, when he got back to his original form of the great ego, the stubborn beast, she was able to just slice off his head. Each time she killed a manifestation, he came back to his own form. When he, she, the, the, when all the manifestations of the ego, all the different forms met their demise, then he came back to his form as the great ego, as the stubborn beast. And then she slayed him. We have a question from Elise. Yes, namaste Elise. Is there any symbolism in the fact that the ego brings a new form out of his mouth? <laughs> <laughs> yes. There is. Uh, do you know, out of his mouth, what comes out of your mouth affects so many more people. It's uh, much more than what goes into your mouth. Uh, whatever you eat, it only affects you. Whatever you speak affects everyone around you, and sometimes it's the shot heard around the world. It, it just travels and travels incessantly. Today, you put it on Twitter, and who knows where it'll end up. So, yes, out of the mouth, comes the biggest changes and that affects how many countless egos are concerned about what comes out of the mouth. We have a question from Moshami in Boulder. Namaste Moshomi. Namaste. I understand why violent timber is a demon, but how can passion be a demon? Don't we need some passion for accomplishing great projects? Yes, and actually we should qualify that and say misdirected passion is a demon. And good passion is good passion. So always we want to have the discrimination. Remember, Moshomi, if you love your husband, that's good passion. If you love her husband, that's not so good. That's going to get you into trouble. Probably get him in the doghouse too. In fact, I can see, foresee that there will only be difficulties all around. But loving your husband and being passionate about him is very beautiful. That will bring you closer together and you together will make a partnership and partnerships, partners work together and they make a beautiful goal and a beautiful plan and then they can implement that plan with cohesive energy and they revolve around each other mutually and reciprocally and who understands this knows what is a chakra. We have a question from both Siddharth and Moshami. No, stay! Uh-oh! <laughs> Pranam, chapter 3 has a graphic description of lots of violence. Does a spiritual seeker experience this at some certain stage of sadhana? Yes, we do. We experience the demise of all of the evil and all of the selfishness within us. Now remember, every character in this book is within us. All the thoughts that are perplexing us and plaguing us, they are all inside of us. And our goal is to eradicate thoughts. Now this is set in the format of a battle. The battle is the divine within me wants to withdraw the energy from the thoughts. In order to do that, I have to become the divine mother. I have to have sufficient devotion so I unite with God. And then when I have that kind of devotion, I forget all about the thoughts. The thoughts themselves, just like Rock the Bija when she drank up all the blood, he ran out of blood. 
And one time the thoughts are going to run out of energy, they're going to run out of gas and their cars are just going to stop right where they are. And so this is a battle that we're all going to face. Now this is, this Chandi part is put in the format of a battle. But so is the Bhagavad Gita. And actually so is the Ramayana. And actually, when you look at all the scriptures of ancient times, even the Bibles got battles, one after another. And so all of the scriptures depict the journey to divinity as a battle of the forces of divinity overcoming the forces of worldliness, of duality. They're all set in the form of a battle. Now that doesn't mean I'm imploring you to all become warriors and you should all become kshatriyas and go out and arm yourselves to the teeth. Without better how we know divine. That's right. It is a battle to know divinity. Without battle, how will we know divine? Very true. We need to fight to win the peace. But the fight is inside. The battle is inside. We are, we are both the armies of division and the armies of unity. We have a question from Julia. Namaste, Julia Ma. Namaste. Ma says in her book, Living with the Soul, there has always been duality in fighting. As long as there are two poles, there is tension in the middle. In the history of humanity, it has always been this way. The only way out, the only way out is to stay in the center, the witness, and watch the whole thing. Continued throughout our life, we will be experiencing this duality, but we have the chance to evolve to become better witnesses? Yes, very nicely said. Om Eng Ring Kling Chamundai Viche. I am Che, con consciousness, Chaitanya, which perceives Vich, which is the Samvit, which is all that is knowable, as the continuous movement Cha. In the paradigm of reality, munda, aimring claim, sristi stiti law, creation, preservation, transformation are constantly changing and moving in the paradigm of reality of all that is knowable as perceived by consciousness. Who am I? It's a choice we have with every perception, Julia. We can per Choose to be the actor. Look at me doing this. Here I am, Joe Sadhu in heaven. Or we can perceive, we could watch as the witness. She Voham. I became her. I became the Divine Mother. I watched the dance of creation on the stage of consciousness. She Voham. That's the choice. Now, in order to make the right choice, we've got to fight the battle. Right. And we have to make ourselves aware. So we apply discrimination with every perception. Is my laziness really the ultimate peace or is it my excuse for inactivity? <laughs> Am I lazy because I want to sit in the bliss and stillness of solitude? Or am I lazy because I'm selfish? And this is my ego speaking. What does discrimination tell me? Am I working because I'm a workaholic? Or am I working because I love my guru? And I love God, and therefore I'm supporting her mission. What does my discrimination say? I don't care what it looks like from the outside. I know from the inside I am lazy because I want to kick back <laughs> and relax. And it's because of my selfishness. I know that when I'm a workaholic, it's because of my selfishness. Those are dis uh, distinctions that each of us is going to make ourselves in every perception as we see our actions and our behavior when we're being lazy 
and when we're being overly active, how do we maintain the balance between too much and too little? We have a question from Ambika in Princeton. Namaste Ambika! Namaste Sham! Namaste Swamiji. Is the mother of the universe battling the great ego on our behalf, or is the divine within us fighting the great ego? How do we internalize and live the Chandi in our daily life? The divine within us is the divine mother. <laughs> However, if you can't remember that, then ask the divine mother outside of us <laughs> to fight with the Asuras so that we can remember. <laughs> And that's how we remember, that's how we do it. Ambika, what we do in our lives, we are doing as servants of the Divine Mother and removing and diffusing the ego attachments to each and every action. And if I can remember that, I love her. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Then, it's not my ego involved. I am the servant of God. Remember, there are five attitudes with which we can come to God. Das Bhav, I'm a servant. Shantan Bhav, I'm a child. Uh, uh, Preme Bhav, I'm a, a Piyari. Uh, uh, I am a lover of God. Shantan Bhav, uh, or uh, Matri Bhav, I am a parent of God. And Yogi Bhav, I am God. Well, Hanuman was a servant of God, and Ram was a child of God. And uh, uh, Shiva is God. <laughs> ah. And uh, uh, we have so many different depictions of what is the ultimate dharma, what is the ultimate bhavana with which we can show our relationship with God. A servant of God, a child of God, a lover of God like Radha and Krishna, like Sita and Ram, a parent of God like Koshalya or Yashoda, uh, and a Yogi Bhav, Aham Ramashmi, like Shiva. These are the attitudes with which we come to God. Now, of course, Ram Krishna said, being a child of God is probably the safest. But Hanuman said, you look inside my heart. All you're going to see is the Ram. He wanted to be the servant of God. You're going to change your bhavana all through the day, just like you change your socks. You're going to keep changing and changing because sometimes you'll be a devotee of God and sometimes you'll be a child of God and sometimes you'll be a servant of God and sometimes you'll get to be God. And the ideal, Ambika, we want to take the God and worship her outside and then take the love and put her inside and then take that, that bobbin and put it on our yantra and put it on flower and do pran patishta and blow our life into it. <sighs> and then we're going to serve her and and sing to her and pray to her and, and then we'll pick up that bobbin and put it back in our hearts and we'll be with her there. The bhavana is changing from moment to moment and allow it to change. But maintain the divinity of that bhavana. We have a question from Swarupananda in Seattle. Namaste Swarupananda! Pranam. As we try to see the ego manifest in ourselves, it seems natural that we begin to see the ego manifest in others. Yet Mother tells us not to find fault in others. How can we internalize this and use it for our own personal growth? I don't want to be like that! <laughs> there is an example for me! There is a lesson for me! I don't want to be inefficient like that! I don't want to be negligent like that! I don't want to be selfish like that! I don't want to speak like that! Now, what do I want to be like? Let me remember my guru. I want to be like my guru. That's why she's the example that I want to follow. If she were not the example that I want to follow, she would not be my guru. A guru is an example. Now, I 
have an example in my life that I want to follow. Look at all those eagles striving for supremacy in the world of duality. Do, do I want to be like that? Nope. Nope, nope, nope. I want to be like my guru. That's why I have a guru. She's the example I want to be like. That's what the guru is. So Swarup, don't worry about what the other egos are doing. Only be concerned about what we're doing. What examples do you want to follow and what do you want to renounce? That will be the discrimination I implore you to maintain. We have another question from Nanda in San Jose. Namaste Nanda Ma! <laughs> Pranam, I want to be unselfish and take pure decisions, but I am afraid of what will happen to me if I am selfless since the world is not such a merciful place. How can I balance the want to be pure and the fear for one's own self-preservation and security? Well, we're going, that insecurity is one of the generals in the army of the great ego. Uh, he comes in the form of haughtiness and disbelief and want of resolution and a, a devoid of clear understanding. It makes me insecure because I don't know what's going to happen. I can't count on it. But let me ask you your downside risk. If everything went belly up and you declared bankruptcy, wouldn't you go sit in a temple <laughs> on the bank of a river and chant the chandi? <laughs> just like the king did, just like the businessman did. You just walk away and go to the Rishi's ashram and say, okay, Rishi, what should I do? If everything went to hell in a handbasket, if it all went downhill to the worst possible result and you lost it all, what would you lose? You would lose your attachment to the material world. And then mother would be saying to you, you don't need it anymore. So I wouldn't be too concerned. Try to give up those fears and those insecurities and try to withdraw the energy from the demon insecurity and to, to give that energy to the gods and to the goddess. Uh, we've got anxiety, Tamram. We've got the great deceiver, Mahanu. We've got irresistible temptation, Durdar. We've got wandering to and fro and hypocrisy and haughtiness and fickleness and devoid of clear understanding. They're all all manifestations of insecurity. They all make us insecure. And our goal is to grab onto the security. Ma achen arami achi babna ki ache amar. I got mama. Mayer hadi kai ami ma ni achen sakal bar. I eat from mother's hand. I do, every day, a every meal. In fact, I don't take food until mama puts something in my mouth. She took my entire responsibility. All I've got to do is make enough to keep her family afloat. <laughs> She'll take care of me. Mine's easy. She's got 35,000 families of kids. I can take care of them. She'll take care of me. Such a deal. We have a question from Sadatmananda. Namaste Sadatmananda. How can we recognize when the generals of the ego are attacking? Oh, you don't feel comfortable. You feel anxious. You feel doubt. You feel disbelief. You feel unclear. You're thinking about memories. You're scheming to get something extra. <laughs> you can recognize the symptoms. Don't tell me you don't know. Akramon! 
attack those weaklings. <laughs> attack those guys, those would-be sadhus. <laughs> They're sitting up on top of a mountain making japa. What's in it for me? What's it? How do I get a little more? How can I expand this a little more? We have a question from Sharanya. Namaste, Sharanya. So many times on the spiritual path, we hear a lot of discussion regarding the benefits of surrender. The Divine Mother and the Chandi aggressively fights the ego. There is no surrender. How does aggressive action benefit our sadhana in daily life? Well, do we want to be aggressive ourselves or do we want the Divine within us, within us to be aggressive against the Asuras that are attacking us within ourselves? Do I want to make aggression the manifestation of my outward behavior in society or do I want to make aggression against myself the inward behavior of my spiritual discipline? And that's the distinction I'm drawing. She is aggressive and there is no surrender. I, I agree. Remember, in Sanskrit, surrender is used by the term, it's defined by the term samarpan. Samo. Arpon. Shamo means equilibrium. Arpon, I offer myself. I offer myself in equilibrium is a little different from the English counterpart surrender. Hands up, I've got no other alternative. My back is against the wall, all is lost. Be gracious and kind to me, please. I implore you to accept my surrender even though I have no choice. Sanskrit surrender says it's the first thing I want to do is offer myself in equilibrium. It's the goal of my sadhana. English surrender says it's the last thing I'm going to avoid as long as I possibly can. So long as there's one bullet left in my gun, I'm gonna try to shoot you. And when there are no more bullets, I will surrender. Be simple. Be simple. <laughs> simple makes true. Please. We have a question from Ambika. Namaste Ambika! What is wrong with memories? Aren't they a helpful tool to help with our learning? Why are they our enemy? Please help me understand. Every time you sit for meditation, <clears throat> what we call meditation, you go to the movies and you say, thanks for the memories. <laughs> Or you don't. <laughs> oh, that was a famous song it, it, when, when we were child, children. Uh, Bob you, Hope used to sing that song uh, 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 in the 40s and 50s. <laughs> uh, anyway, we weren't thankful. We're today we're not thankful for all the memories. I'm sitting down to meditate and here comes the movies. And there's a movie, I don't want to see that movie, what I did with that guy so many years ago, way back when, when I was with someone, oh my, blah! Why is that memory coming to me? It's keeping me from being with God, I want to meditate. Here I am in the bliss of consciousness, watching the movies of yesterday. I don't want to watch the movies of yesterday. Let me change the station. I don't want to see that movie anymore. That's why we don't want the memories. General memories is a pain in the mind. Or backside, or wherever you feel it. Yes, please. We have a question from Sadatmananda. Yes, Sadatmananda. The ego turns into the king of elephants. What is the significance of this? Oh, he appears to be a big, huge, massive warrior, the conveyance of, uh, of, uh, of the armies. Remember, Chaturanga Shena, the, the four divisions of, uh, of uh, an ancient army were infantry, bowmen, uh, cavalry, and elephants. Uh, so elephants were like the tanks, the armored cavalry. Uh, and the cavalry were the horses, and then there came the bowmen, and then came the infantry, the foot soldiers. So it's like the armored tanks division of tanks were coming in, just like uh, Russia standing on the borders of Ukraine, <laughs> just ready to roll over you. 
Om Sam Sarasvati Namaha Namaste